things about that early life of the church in Kiev that takes place from about this point, 988, uh, until the 13th century. David Larson made a comment after the last class that I thought was interesting. And David, give the context of this uh, and your, your experience with the Hagia Sophia. Well, it was just an, an anecdote. First of all, I think the immensity of that building just the picture doesn't capture the imagination and, and, the, and the immensity and the splendor of that building. And when you think about it in the, in the uh, being built in the 300s. But they're up on the second floor of the balcony, there's carvings from the Vikings, uh, from a guy by the name of Hadrian, that's been authenticated in terms of its date by the Turkish, uh, the Turkish National, the, the Turkish Museum System, whatever, whatever it's called. And they apparently dovetailing into what you said, Duane, they, they came down through the Baltic Sea and then through the river system in, into uh, Constantinople with their trading and, and, and raiding. Okay. So that you... Yeah, so this is the non-Christian part of the Norwegian heritage. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw authentic verification of the, 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 the Viking type blood had been there to the Hagia in, in, in other parts of Constantinople, but, but yeah. particularly in that area. Yeah. actually into the wood, uh, I mean, or in the wood and stone, which had been dated, then carbon dated and things like that, just to make sure about the dates. Oh, I thought that was a you know, fascinating connection to that. Uh, if we have time at the end, I'm going to show you a few pictures that Ann and I took during our 1988 visit to the millennium of that Orthodox Church in 1988. But in Kiev, uh, there is something called the Monastery of the Caves that goes back into the early 11th century. And the Monastery of the Caves it kind of is a, is a long span that, that goes along the Dnieper River. And as we entered into this experience, you start walking down, uh, you know, you, you, you enter into it on ground level, and you start descending. And it's a winding pathway, and uh, there it's lighted enough to, to get by, but it's very narrow. And as we got down deeper, I suddenly realized off here there was a, an opening and, and a little lighted space, and here was the remains of, of a saint of the church. So it is actually a monastery of the caves where saints from back in that era of time were buried. And here is the, came to the point and I saw here is the sign with Nestor, the chronicler, the historian. And uh, my, they look so small, but uh, wrapped in, in the, the robes of whatever was appropriate of that time. But it was, it was a very moving experience to walk. And it's a, it was a long walk, as I recall, that the time we spent wandering uh, through these caves. Um, but to see Nestor the Chronicler was, was a, a significant experience, uh, for me at least. And, so the Monastery of the Caves became a real spiritual center for the church during the centuries that it was in Kiev. And now to pick up the story about the divide that happens between the East and the West. Um, we go back to Photius, remember, and uh, Pope Nicholas in 867, they had sort of excommunicated each other, but it's that that really didn't provide the lasting split to the life of the church. There were several reasons why the church began to drift apart. And really, up until this point, it's, it's, we were really not just one church because we had already the Ethiopians, the Armenians, they had, the Coptics had moved off into their own tradition uh, after Chalcedon. But really, in a sense, there was still just one church. But there was a lot of reasons why we started going in separate directions. The Western church tends to be very logical. Uh, the East tends to be much more mystical. The Orthodox always were willing to see the, the bishop in Rome as the elder brother. Really have had no problem with that. But never were willing to assume that that bishop of Rome, called the Pope, had any authority over the Eastern Church. Uh, where the Pope was infallible or declared infallible for at least that part of the Church that became Roman Catholicism, the Eastern Church says no authority does not rest in the Pope, but in the ecumenical councils of the Church. When the whole Church meets, that's when the Church speaks, and that's where we have our authority. 
the Eastern Church has always been uncomfortable with the, the Western Church's, Catholic Church's emphasis on purgatory, which Luther objected to, uh, to indulgences, which Luther objected to, uh, and to priestly celibacy, which Luther objected to. So in many ways, we, we have some real commonality uh, with the Orthodox folks. The Roman and the Latin Church always saw the Eastern Church and, and the Byzantine Empire as sort of a bulwark and guard against the spread of Islam. Uh, and both branches of the Church kind of sought to claim common territory as they reached out in missions. So as we see Constantinople reaching up into Moravia and then up into that Eastern Europe, so that was true for Catholicism. But the fundamental difference, the thing that really broke the relationship had to do with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The Orthodox confess the Nicene Creed, and we as a Western Church confess the Nicene Creed. Join me if you can at the start, if you can pick it up. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. Ah, ah, the Orthodox Church stops after Father who proceeds from the Father. The addition and the Son, which we do, crept into the church in Spain in about the 6th century, but it really didn't catch on and begin, begin to be used extensively in the Western church and Catholicism until about the 11th century, right where we are at that point. And it became a tremendously divisive issue in the church, and it still is today. Uh, the Roman Catholics inserted that clause, and orthodoxy says, orthodoxy suspects that the West stresses the unity of the Trinity at the expense of the diversity of the three persons of the Godhead. Well, that issue has, has been and still is a great, great divide in the church. Uh, I mentioned last time we talked about how so many issues of doctrine were main street issues. I mean, there were issues that people debated in the coffee and on the golf course, wherever they gathered. That was true of this issue. It was a, it was a main street issue. It was an issue that people were deeply involved in, deeply concerned about, and still are. The Eastern Church is firm uh, in that point, who proceeds from the Father, period. Uh, now that may seem to us like, uh, you know, playing with words, but to them it's a tremendously, tremendously serious issue.